Today you'll get to hear from experts, not just in their field, and, and they're going to tell some stories, but advocates to help us identify what we'd like to see. Kurt, can we start? Sure. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kurt Scherer. I'm the director of the Museum Innovation Center, so thank you all for being in the center this morning. Um, as a way of background, I've, I've, I've really only had two jobs in my career. The first one was for um, arguably one of the most innovative organizations on the planet, and that's the United States Marine Corps, where I flew helicopters for about 10 years. And it is the answer, it is the thing that's going to help all organizations respond to that change in the right way. Real leadership is personal, it allows resilience, and it allows teams to be able to absorb this change in a way that allows them to be effective and to accomplish whatever mission they're on. Good morning. Uh, I'm Phyllis Newhouse, and I'm the CEO and founder of Extreme Solutions. I'm a 23 year Army veteran, a retired uh, Army, and uh, started Extreme Solutions, and we're primarily a cybersecurity company that specializes in ethical hacking and cyber solutions as it pertains to more of the vulnerability uh, or creating scenarios for cyber warfare. Um, I'm excited about this panel today to really talk about innovation from a perspective of, of where we're heading in terms of cyber warfare and how we innovate uh, within organizations and who are those innovators uh, as we start looking into the next five years of where we will, where we will be. So I'm excited about that opportunity today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rania Motet. I'm the CEO of Undefray Technologies. We're a design technology company based in San Francisco that operates globally. Our focus is on building software solutions for advanced manufacturing. And we also work with inventors and startups to help them develop product ideas from early stage of a concept to design prototype manufacture and distribute to market. I am also a social impact leader in education, women empowerment and gender equality initiatives within the country and globally as well. My work in education is focused on working with schools to bring design and technical education to their curriculums. So the aim is to prepare students to participate in the workforce of innovation in the future by facilitating this kind of learning experiences. My work in women empowerment also involves mentoring and advising aspiring women entrepreneurs and early stage founders across different areas of technology innovation to help them build their companies and get funded. And as an extension of that, my work uh, related to gender equality involves working with organizations to help them build strategies to bring more equity to their teams, which facilitates bringing more women into leadership, but also helps to create healthier gender dynamics and collaborations as well for um, hello everyone, um, Kirsten made a mistake when she was introducing uh, us because I'm not a rock star, very clearly. Uh, I worked in private sector, nonprofit, public sector, I was a government a policy advisor, I did a software startup. I've had a variety of different perspectives. The opportunities to look at organizations from the inside, many of them large organizations, and I was struck by Remarkable consistency within large organizations. A command and control, patriarchal uh, culture, uh, which dampened down innovation. Um, uh, very poor information flows within the organizations. Um, and uh, decision making that worked well in the silo, but never worked well in the silo. And I think leadership, um, there's, a, there's an old big proverb that says the fish rots from the head down. Uh, and I thought, I think we have a lot of stinking fish uh, organizations, or I call them zombie organizations. And, and, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm very passionate about the, the need for uh, leaders to renew themselves in order to renew their organizations and become uh, more innovative. There's a panel, and I, I've written out, I'm, sure, I'm really bad at this, and I have a book coming out uh, uh, in, in a couple of months called Building Smarter Organizations How to Lead Your Zombie Organization. And it's really focused on people inside organizations who want to make their organizations uh, innovative. Um, so. 
what we were hoping the book would be ready. It's not quite open. He does have a, a postcard out there that reminds about the book, and I think he's got a good discount on it. There's a discount code. It's very hard to remember. It's IAOIP. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about collaboration and communication, um, Randy and I, when we were in the back of the room, we were talking about Innovacon 4.1, 4.2, and we are talking about maybe San Francisco um, having a location that could work really well. So exciting stuff. So I get to ask a question of each. As a, as a talk show, each person answers and the others can weigh in. And then if we have extra time, well, then, then you won't get to ask questions. If you run out of questions, we have some, some extras. So, Kurt, how is leading innovation efforts different than executing innovation work? And what are the traits of aspiring leaders? I had a mentor a long time ago say, all organizations do two things. They bring up a couple and put one of your own spots. So one is, this is obvious and we all know this, but... I think if you think about your organizations, it doesn't happen all the time. The first one is leaders have to provide top cover. And that is critical when you're going on an innovation organization. Um, one of the examples that our leadership, so Karen Day had led this, the beginning of the strategic innovation group um, about five years ago. And one of the things she did to make this point so effectively was that she actually printed get out of jail free cards. So, and she gave them out. So they were laminated cards that we could put on our bags and carry with us. And, and they were used a couple times, in fact, in, for real, but the, what was more important was the intent, the fact that she was saying that I need you as my leadership team to, to take some chances, to try some things. And I mean that so much that if you actually need something where you make a mistake, you can give me this card or give your leader this card, and there will be no questions asked. I mean, obviously, with the reason and so forth. But, but she meant it, and, and that was a great signal. So we all know that innovating requires risk, and as a leader, you have to provide that space for your team to, to be able to take that risk in an appropriate way. The second thing is really about creative culture. Again, for those of you that were here yesterday, we had some great workshops. How many times you hear the word culture? It's probably about as many times you hear the word innovation. I mean, they start to get sort of reused. Culture begins with the thoughts of people on your team, and you as a leader in your head. Those thoughts turn to ideas, ideas turn to actions, actions turn to behaviors, behaviors turn to habits. And it's the collective habits of the team or organization that plants culture. So if you believe that, it is imperative for leaders and innovative organizations to start at the beginning of that chain and to get some mind share of the people on your team to get out of the press of the inbox, get out of the normal day mission that you are working on, and get them to think differently, because that's the only way you're going to have sustainable change. And the third thing I'll bring up, and this is, and I really appreciate the comments on the kind of the, the large organization hierarchical, hierarchical view. There has been this metaphor for a decade at least that says that being a leader is like playing chess. And so you're the grand chess master, and if you can move your pieces on the board more effectively than your opponent, then, then you're going to win. Where I think, and again, this is where things are changing enough where the realization is coming slower than the actual facts is that leadership today is much more like, so you're not controlling. You're just enabling the environment to allow a much bigger thing than you could possibly manage or think about every uh, aspect of yourself happen. And so that's another thing, particularly from an innovative organization, that thinking about that metaphor as a gardener as opposed to a chess master, I think can be really fun. Before, Phyllis, I'm not. So the way we met was business executives for national security, and um, we ended up getting seated together at this dinner and uh, the CEO of the group said, weren't you guys going to talk to anybody else all night long? <laughs> so the, the group is focused on bringing um, business practices into government where government will use and then adding the efficiencies and the, the measurements and things like that. And you have been such a, a driver for successes in areas that shouldn't be deemed success, bringing women up and bringing people up through the ranks that don't look like the typical board members, at least here in the U.S., how do you, are you in your own organization and as you work with others, because you truly are an evangelist on the topic, um, who are these innovative leaders? What are some of the qualities and how are you helping to plant seeds or help others to plant seeds in garden? Well, 
Well, I'll, I'll start with this. I think uh, the innovative leaders are certainly, um, from our perspective, they're you know, the creative thinkers in organizations. I'm thinking uh, in our organization, in my own organization, and you're right, the culture is so important. So we need to go through that and say, okay, we're, we, we want to have Innovation Week. And that Innovation Week is really an opportunity for, so if you think about ethical hackers, right? Okay, what's an ethical hackers, right? So we, when we think about that, um, we want, we're, we're trying to be on the cutting edge of technology that requires us to really have a culture that, that fits and brings um, innovation, right? And so as leaders, uh, you know, we, it's important to get that buy-in all the way from the top to the lowest person. I'll give you a good example. We were, we were looking at, in five years, where, where do we need to be on some cutting-edge technology? So we wanted to create a um, cyber warfare. We wanted to be able to show, whether it was a federal agency or an organization, um, how, what would happen, what, what's the worst thing that could happen to your organization should you have a major breach? And so what we did was we went out to the organization and we asked all of our, our people to be really a thought leader and say, what's the worst that you see from your side as an ethical hacker that could happen to the state of Georgia, example, right? What if we took the water departments offline? What if we interrupted the grid system. What if we did all of that? And let's go into this and create scenarios that would cause a disaster. That's the worst that can happen, right? And we did that. And so now what we're doing, we took all those scenarios and we created technology that could create, create these scenarios in real time using real live viruses and, and, um, uh, and, and, and we can use a stress test to see how well would a city or a state respond if all of these things happen at one time for these networks offline or interrupting those networks. And to be able to do that and create the technology and now we're able to show this from a global perspective, this is what happened if we were to, to do this in five states. This is the disaster. And so that took the thought leaders having the idea, but really wrapping that vision around the idea and getting the innovation thought to come back. And, and it was actually about two or three people that said, hey, we can create scenarios. And when we create these scenarios, it gives people real-time data to show what would really happen. And that's a great example of how we were able to, from the, from the leadership, to say, we don't have all the answers, but if we take those great ideas that they have and put the vision around it, we can create where we want to be in five years. And we've had a, literally a 34% growth rate every single year for the last seven years in this business. And it comes, I think a lot of that goes back to having those innovation days, um, the organization looking forward to being able to put their ideas out there. So that's one way. I wanted actually to add a couple of comments about innovation and execution. I think that there are two major problems. One is organizational and one is leadership. Uh, when it comes to organizations, organizations are traditionally designed to execute, not to innovate. And that's a major problem. It makes it very difficult for them to be innovative when they're not capable of overcoming and compromising on some traditional measures of performance in order to foster innovation. Also, leaders who are only trained to execute on the strategies to the dots without thinking creatively can be problematic to participating and fostering innovation within any organization. So both need to have the same traits. For leaders, they need to be able to be both operational and innovative, which means they have to be creative and disciplined at the same time. So nurturing that duality is very essential to innovation. And I think that's what really brings the balance and poses the gap between aspiration to innovate and ability to execute within organizations. Well, have you seen others that have done the get out of jail? Card? I mean, I know it's symbolic, but so often the military is the <laughs> In the military, that's, that's, that's huge. Uh, yeah. Lord knows I needed to get out a lot of times, but, <laughs> but that's big, yeah. 
Well, how empowering. So often, even if you're with a big innovative organization, you have an idea if it doesn't succeed, you get slapped down. So no good deed goes unpunished. And so people are afraid to innovate. But if you've been empowered from the top in your leadership to say, go ahead and innovate within, you know, don't do the legal stuff, but you know, find things to, to push the envelope. So I'm having this, you know, there's so many leaders who like to have the facade of innovation. I can see so many people grabbing that idea and passing it around, but everybody knows mm -hmm. that it's only for very minor things and you better not do anything significant or else you will get cut down. And I think this is behind this, the, you know, having leaders shift out of execution mode into encouraging innovation change. Listen, they got to be leaders because they're really, really good at execution. And I think this is a huge challenge for leadership because they got to where they were because they're really good at command and control and analysis and looking backwards and adding 10% more next year but not fundamentally changing anything. And they get into a position, if they're lucky, they realize that that approach is no longer going to carry the organization successfully forward. Many of them don't even understand that. Basically, they just want to keep going in a straight line because for the last 10 or 15 or 25 years, that's what's made them successful. And that's a profound challenge at an individual level for someone who's been really, really successful one way to now have to think differently. And it's, it, it's very, and I can just see them using the card, but by making sure everybody knows that this is only for small things, not big things. I love that point, Greg, and going back to Zoraida's point, too, in the sense that if you think about it, the purpose of management is to reduce uncertainty, right? It's to create certainty. And the big challenge we have, and it could almost be an irony in the fact that we have such better reporting systems and ways to get data and information technology and, and all the things that have happened just in the last 15 years, really is that it becomes much easier for leaders to see three or four levels down in the organization. And the point of management is, is to reduce uncertainty, whereas the point of innovation is to increase uncertainty. And so there has to be a balance between those points and a, a conscious effort on the part of leadership to resist the temptation to reduce uncertainty when you're talking about taking risk and innovative efforts. Well, part of the challenge in that frame that it works for a publicly traded company it was managing to the year then to the quarter i was with one they were managing to the pay cycle and how do you reduce uncertainty when you're trying to manage that tightly can i yeah so so we've had um to go to work with some oil and gas companies and in oil and gas and i don't know if this is across the whole industry but certainly for this particular client where um, over the past 20 years or so, they created, they had some big accidents in the early 80s. And so their leadership focus was to create a culture of safety. And so everything they did, down to the beginning of every single meeting, was to talk about safety. If we started every meeting, they have a safety moment. We would have, no kidding, as a consultant, we were, I was walking with my colleague, we were walking down some stairs just after an interview. And our client stops at the bottom of the stairs and he said, you know, and I'm always going to address my, my colleagues, like, you know, I noticed that you um, you didn't use the handrail on the way down. And he was dead. So I'm going to start laughing out loud. Uh, he was dead serious. So that, but the point is they, they, they did such a good job of ingraining this culture of safety in everything they did. The problem was that that led over in the areas where they need to innovate and take risks. And so there could be, aviation is another area where the challenge is how do you keep this overriding sense of culture in places where you need certainty and where you need to manage things down to the penny and maybe even daily, but keeping that isolated from other areas where you need to allow a little bit more freedom. So Gordon, in your book, I mean, you, you gave us a, a taste of kind of the, the look at it. How do you, have you seen organizations develop tools and culture to help go from zombie organizations or a state of fear? Because I think I had that same client on the financial services side, and, and we would get up and we'd be talking about cards and payments, and but we had to have a safety moment. And one of our interns went, dude, you got to give me a safety moment before we do this. Um, so he did like internet safety or something, but it was 
every single meeting had to start with it. So think of how much productivity was lost just in, in that. But, well, so I mean, I think that uh, so first off, you know, there's this tension that organizations have between structure and and unstructured change. I don't think it's it's we talk about it as a balance. I think it's there's this notion of polarity management, and there's no right answer at any particular moment. But you're held at an equilibrium point that keeps shifting one way or the other. And I think a leader's job is really going back to Kurtz mentioned uh, the, the chess master versus the gardener. I think that comes from a gentleman from McChrystal's book, A Team of Teams, uh, and his experience in, in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, I think really what a leader's job is to do is to shift, is to create uh, an environment. Uh, to modify the environment, uh, try to remove barriers or increase attractors for the kind of behavior that you want. So the kind of, you know, the get out of jail free card is an example of something leaders could do to communicate, to change the environment, and to say risk taking, or at least some risk taking, uh, is, is now uh, open to you. And so really as a leader, you have to shift your mindset instead of telling people what to do, command and control, father knows best, and, and you know, I, I use that invitedly, to uh, what, what, is, what is in our environment that's holding people back from the behaviors that we now need them to do, and how do we increase and accelerate uh, the behaviors that we do want. Uh, for you, those of you that were in my workshop yesterday, you know that I hate at performance management systems. Those systems, there's a lot of levers uh, that, that you have, and really it's about pruning the environment, changing the conditions so that you can enable people to move forward. And one of the fundamental ones, and leaders do this all the time, unconsciously, or is it subconsciously? No, I'm sure. That unconscious, you're like, is there a doctor in the room that help me out here? I think it's somehow, leaders do this all the time. They create a narrative around what the organization is and what's it about. And I think one of the goals of leaders going forward is to create a new narrative and help explain the story of the organization. And that, and what you're trying to do ultimately is to have a voluntary, spontaneous alignment to the goals and the purpose of the organization. Uh, and you do that through storytelling. I'm not saying you pull out a children's book and you start reading the story, but every time you interact with people in the organization, whether it's in the elevator for two minutes or you know speaking at a, at a, at a you know, town hall, you have to help them tell the story about what it is that you're doing and why people need to have certain behaviors. I want to add something in relation to zombie organizations. I think it's interesting to also think about opposite cases of some of the organizations that have been able to survive regardless of not changing strategy, of not making profit, maintaining the status quo as long as possible because of their leadership, and also because of support by financial institutions and governments. To give an example, if we look at comparison between the U.S. market and Japan, Japan is the best case for studying zombie uh, companies. Yeah. <laughs> You'll really enjoy yeah. that. But that's particularly because most of the financial funding from large banks comes by backing from the government. So companies like Shaw, for example, they've been doing badly for so long. And because of bailouts available to them and being backed by the government repetitively, they've been able to stay in the market. They're still dominating a large portion of the market, creating congestion, blocking new aspiring entrepreneurs who might have innovative ideas they want to bring in, but they are scared to make the investment to enter the market. So they end up leaving Japan, coming to Silicon Valley or other parts of the world where they could bring their ideas to test them out in the marketplace. Also, if we look at the case with uh, U.S. bailouts with the auto industry, with GM and Chrysler, for example, it was the same thing. It was more about trying to gain time so Tesla Motors doesn't actually get to, to where it's actually getting to right now. So uh, it was a matter of investing back in these companies just to gain that time. But with that particular example in the U.S., it's probably not going to repeat because it was just part of the recession time. But in Japan, it just repeats all the time. It's nonstop. So it's important to, as much as we invest energy and time into creating strategies to transform companies that are zombie into innovative companies, also to develop strategies for creative destruction. And financial institutions and leaders have to take responsibility to make conscious decisions about that when it's necessary. 
and I spent uh, 15 years in, in government, and it's a big challenge for governments because, uh, amazingly enough, you know, the you know, there's no market, as we know, no or very little market pressure on government. So there is political pressure, but political pressure works in quite a different way than a market uh, mechanism. Uh, my analogy is that politically, things get stuck for about 10 to 15 years. It's like tectonic plates. The pressure builds up. This law isn't working. This this agency isn't delivering what it's supposed to do. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. All organizations, including private sector organizations, like to organize things that makes it easy for them. The market forces organizations to adapt and change to emerging needs. And that's a real challenge for those of you that are involved in public sector innovation um, uh, because the whole government works basically on we keep doing what we did last year and maybe change something by one or two, two percent. Um, I think one of the other elements that, that we're describing in terms of you have leaders that say they want to be innovative, mm -hmm. but are maybe a couple of different scenarios you've seen. One is they you have someone, a senior in the organization that's responsible for innovation but is new to it. Um, or you have maybe a CEO or a senior at the top of the organization that recognizes that it's needed but doesn't know how to do it. It can't just be a, a check the box activity. Um, another about the Army, not the Marine Corps, so we'll, we'll talk about the Navy. Right, they, they decided, and, and I'll, I mean, I'm just from where we were looking up and talking to some, some folks in the United States Navy, they have the idea, and I think they're changing the sound, but from, from the secretary that every officer and senior enlisted sailor was going to be assessed on innovation. So it was almost, you have now something on your evaluation that said, I am innovative. That's going to be have a really hard time working right? because it's not good from the bottom line. It's not changing things, and now you're taking existing activities that maybe were classified as lean or something else, and not quantum innovative, just so you can get a check in the box. It has to be more sophisticated than that. You have to get buy-in from the actual organization. You have to think about the incentives, the decision rights, the rules and responsibilities, the information flows, all the things that actually make an organization work and get back to what's in it for me, to why this matter to the organization, how am I helping mission, and make it something that's embedded into the organization, not just to check the box. So I've got a question for Randy, but first, hopefully everybody has a tablet or a laptop with them where you can use your phone. Some of the bios of the folks up here, um, click on those links below their pictures on the, the Innovacon website, and you will see just some incredible depth that we're not going to get to here and make for some great fun at a cocktail hour. <laughs> so, when we know that your passions on innovation include empowerment, education, collaboration, what are some of the barriers to innovations that organizations face, and how can they make innovation part of a strategic planning process? To backtrack a little bit, at its core definition, innovation is about creating impact, whether that is through a process or product service innovation. It's about um, the production and the exploitation of value-added novelty, whether that is by transforming an existing market or by creating a completely new one. Most companies, if not all companies by its day and age, they do understand that innovation is critical to maintain a competitive edge and also to grow and succeed as a business. But the reality is not all companies succeed at innovating because fundamentally they lack the effectiveness to build a sustainable organization-wide competence for innovation. And many CEOs also tend to not know where to turn when they are facing barriers, and there are many out there. So I will focus on six major ones that are most common, and I think they're actually the strongest. Number one is lack of vision. I think any company that wants to foster innovation, they have to have a vision. It's through vision that a company can move into the future. Number two is having highly complex, rigid structures and mindsets. 
when we look at more mechanistic structures and uh, logical thinking based kind of companies, we can see it's very difficult for them not only to think innovatively, but also to change how they're used to doing things. So they're very stuck in their own ways. And in order to foster innovation within these kind of environments, we need to create thinking change for everybody within the organization. And the third uh, point is about conformity to core structures. If companies tend to follow their business models and core structures very intensively and what happens in that kind of uh, mode is they tend to influence new ideas very strongly and they tend to want to conform these ideas into what has worked for them in the past. And that creates a huge barrier for companies to be able to innovate. The fourth point is uh, fear of failure and also avoiding taking risks. And they're both detrimental to innovation. Innovation requires both ability to accept failure as a natural part of the creation process and they have to be able to take risks in order to adapt to new ways of thinking because through that process, even if they're making wrong decisions or they're failing in certain types of processes, within that experience what's happening is that they are gaining access to a lot of innovative idea generation that could potentially break the company out of the pack and help them to lead forward in a particular innovation. Uh, number five is insufficient funding, which uh, it's a huge one. It's useless to bring a creative team together with the purpose of innovating when you can't fully fund them. That's uh, kind of against the concept of innovation as well. But what happens here also is that because companies can't fund sufficiently if they don't have a deep understanding of how creative mind processes work and how creative teams also behave and operate. So that needs to be set and uh, understood very well before funding efficiently can happen. And also leaders need to be able to stand for questions and be able to defend ideas to bring innovation to happen within their organizations. And for that, they need to develop a willpower and also they need to be able to persuade their boards uh, why they need the money and how it's going to be spent in most cases. And uh, the last one is uh, having unrealistic expectations when it comes to timelines and wanting sooner payoffs. That's also a huge barrier when having this sense of urgency within uh, leadership teams or within companies in general. That makes it very difficult. So if leaders don't understand that, ideas need time to incubate, to form, to reform, and be able to reconstruct them over time in order to bring something concrete to the table, they could definitely intervene at a much earlier time and that could block the innovation process from happening. But also, with all of that, we need to also understand something very important is that there needs to be more of a holistic approach to innovation and to building competence for innovation within organizations. And that takes more of a systematic approach to tackle issues that are underlying and interconnected across many different areas within a company, whether that is leadership organization or peoples and skills, culture and values, or processes and tools. So only tackling one problem does not really help companies to have more of a sustainable strategy. Yeah. I, I love your holistic point of view, and that's, I'd like to get your thoughts, and maybe the audience at the right time around, expanding that holistic view to outside relationships and alliances. Mm -hmm. So and recently there was a, a big thing about Uber, about brilliant jerks, and working in a Game of Thrones type environment within Uber. So that's actually, I think, I wrote a blog post that basically argued this was not an aberration. This was not like a random thing. Most organizations, most of the time, like brilliant jerks. You can deliver, it doesn't matter how nasty or rude or, or misogynistic you are. Um, and internally, it's you're always trying to fight the other teams or other groups or other geographies. And Uber, I think, is an extreme example, but an example nonetheless of a pretty prevalent of attitude or view amongst the leadership who happen to be in uh, the Fortune 500, basically tall white males. The numbers are absolutely phenomenal, way beyond any reasonable expectation. You have tall white males running most organizations.
organizations most of the time, and you get a lack of diversity in thinking, a lack of diversity in, in participation. It's not terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, you know, I, I mean, I, I really, I'm pretty passionate about the fact that uh, I was speaking with someone, a friend of mine at the World Bank, and I said, you know, like we need to shake things up. We really need to. And, and the people that we have leading the organization, they may not be psychopaths, but there's a lot of them around, yeah. and they're they're sort of they have a they have a they have a narrow view of the world because the MBA does not teach you to be an innovative gardening leader. It it teaches you how to analyze and command and control, and that still exists today in most business school programs and, and their approach. So anyway, I'll stop right there. You're hitting on the, one of the key tenets for IOIP is this collaboration. And, and bringing folks into the discussion that generally are not part of the discussion. If it is planting those seeds within our organizations, our industries, our borders, outside our borders. So that is a, a good call to action. So guys, we have about eight minutes left. Um, for quick. I think I see them there. Oh, do you want me to ask them? So my take on Japan is we have people still working like 16 hours a day. You've got an alcoholic culture where after you finish work, you go out and you drink. So it's really hard for women to get ahead in Japan. It's even hard for a man who's got a family to get ahead if he wants to stay married and have his kids love him. But this is like this macro cultural issue. But hey, with 23,000 employees, you kind of almost have the same kind of thing. Is how do you change a culture that's that big and that ingrained in tradition, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone want to solve Japan's problem? <laughs> you know, uh, I'll tell you something. You brought up Japan. I, I, brought up Japan. Japan. I lived in Japan for six months and I actually did get to work with the government on uh, projects for developing the uh, towns that were hit by the tsunami. It was uh, a collaboration with different technology departments from different universities. So that was as far as we were able to get in terms of innovating within the restrictions of what the government had limited us to do. But speaking of culture, I think that there is an intersection between what happens in societies outside and what happens within organizations. What you mentioned about psychopathy. <laughs> um, so having uh, support systems for bad behavior and immoral behavior, but at the same time tapping those people on the back for succeeding in a one-dimensional way for being able to make money or scale businesses, that it's such a toxic way of thinking about building societies because what you're projecting to the outside, you're telling them that it's okay to be this person as long as you could make money and hire people and be able to get investors to give you billions of dollars to put in the bank and understand why you're not making profit, Uber is not profitable still at this point. So, you know, it's important to understand is what we teach in our societies and what kind of values we allow to be fostered. It also transcends into how culture and organizations operate. That's why for me personally, I'm very passionate about working with organizations to help to bring equity, to bring healthier behaviors, to promote more collaboration and balance between genders. And also uh, the schools helping students from an early age to normalize these differences. So it helps people to work together without thinking that they're different. They're capable of doing the same work. They're capable of participating in the workforce in the future and potentially bring innovation and amazing solutions to the world yet to see. But we have to work on making our societies healthier so we could build healthier organizations that have healthy cultures and moral values, that support moral values. And I'm a huge advocate for that. So that should be another discussion is our culture comes through our kids, right? Yes. So I don't know if all of you are experiencing this with, with your kids, but there is so much squelching of innovation. You sit down, you do what you're told, you do your test, and maybe you get to do an extra project that's somewhat creative. We are killing innovation in our kids, and it would take, I think we could find places to plant these seeds, 
but we would need to help to develop what that looks like. You can't go into a school district and say, hey, we have an idea. You have to say, here's the idea, and then you have to be able to fund some of that. So I know that's one of the things that um, Brett's been passionate about, is how do we get innovation back into our schools, especially the public schools, because right now all we're doing is testing, and we're all ready to test. And honestly, I, I, um, I mentor a young girl, um, she's 17 years old, and she has a, about a $90 million company, she's only 17, and she started the company when she was eight, eight years old, and, and she's been able to scale that, she just turned 17, but and we, Ramonda and I, we were with her last week, but when you, when you start talking about innovation in the school, I also say that when you talk to the parents of this, this young girl, innovation started at home. Uh, it wasn't in the school system and because she's never she's she's been homeschooled. And so one of one of the things was fascinating about uh, she has an animation company, technology company. Um, and one of the things was fascinating, I was asking her from a youth perspective, what has driven this with you? And she said, you, you know, she said, I in terms of innovation, I look I'm looking at you know you know the trends and future trends, future tri trends. And I'm thinking about that three years out. She's, and amazingly, when I was eight, I was really thinking about this, where will we be in three years? And, and, and amazing that she's been able to scale that business to that level, and I'm, was, I'm only 17 years old. So again, I you mentioned the schools. I think that innovation started at home. Let me give another quick example. So. Um, Bruce Allen's partnered with an organization called the Innovation Solutions Consortium, which has just got approval from the state of Virginia, say just about six months ago, where you can think about what we're talking about. So the problem with schools is, is reducing that certainty, keep that child in the seat, don't let anything crazy happen. But think about these things, getting children to ask, what if something were possible? Having more group-based work, helping to solve real problems. One of the best ways to do those things is through crowdsourcing and through crowd-based challenges. So ISC now has, through curriculum at the 5th at the and 6th grade level, also at the ninth and 10th grade level, the ability to put crowdsourced challenges by government organizations or outside corporations to engage groups of students in a crowdsourcing challenge. So that's like one of their classes. So now you have children who sort of going in and sitting down with their lecture, they are engaged not only in collaboration and thinking about what if, but they're solving problems on behalf of military, government, or corporations. And that is now happening within the state of Virginia. And there is being audited by 10 other state education boards. So we're, we're getting there. Uh, also through a lot of work that I've done in that realm of doing competitions and, and running more public challenges with the U.S. Department of Education and with also the Office of Technology, part of the White House initiatives, the main challenge was not really to promote the ideas and to bring people together and to bring people to participate. The main challenge was funding. So ideas were able to achieve a certain level and after that they did not have sufficient funding in order to proceed with application and uh, execution. And um, that's another problem when it comes to working with the public sector. Money is a huge issue and I think that there is an opportunity for private companies to jump in and collaborate to close that gap because the public sector is obviously inadequate uh, in that department. So I'm going to... Um say so it's almost time for the, the break. Thank you. If any of you are interested either in this education we create a working group on that or a webinar that any of, of our, our guests could host, let us know on that. A few highlights that came out of this. Kurt talked about the get out of jail free cards and the impact of that. Um, that leadership today needs to be less like a chess master and more like a gardener. Um, Phyllis talked about ethical hacking and what if scenarios, so what are some of the worst case things, and getting left of boom on that, so that we're prepared instead of just reacting. Um, Phil was talked about crafting the visions of what could be, having your own organization's innovation week, an, an internal event. Gordon talked about fish rotten, rots from the head down. So innovation must be driven from the top, and we shape our tools, and our tools shape us. Um, you talked about a lot of things, developing strategy for strategic destruction. 
that would terrify stockholders if they didn't understand what you're talking about. Your mission is about creating impact and creating value, adding novelty. So, so many of the CEOs we've talked to said, oh, that's a novelty, that innovation stuff, it's just a novelty. But value adding novelty, if we can carry that forward as innovators, that this isn't a harebrained idea, it, it can actually deliver some bottom line. So, with that, enjoy your break. Thank you to the panelists.